Holy Spirit changed my message on me yesterday, so this is all fresh off the press. <laughs> so, over the past few nights, we've been talking about getting out of our comfort zone. We've been talking about being in Egypt as individuals. We are in the wilderness as a community, and then we enter the promised land as a family. And then it comes down to our being, our whole being existing in Abba. This year, we've been on a journey to the heart of the festivals to find the deeper meaning and significance behind the observations that we've been observing year after year and the significance behind them. We are going to a higher level. So I want to talk tonight about what the heart of Sukkot is. And I know each one of us have a different perspective and a different part of the heart of Sukkot. Um, and this is just what Holy Spirit's been showing me over the past few days about it. Um, so what was the purpose of Abba delivering his people out of Egypt? Um, and that's the point where we're going to spring off tonight. Um, in Exodus chapter 7, verse 14 through 16. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. Exodus chapter 7, verse 14 through 16. And we're right in the middle of... Or actually, it's the beginning of the Exodus story when God begins speaking to Moses about bringing the people out of, out of Egypt. Verse 14 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard and stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. He will be going out to the water. Wait for him by the river's brink. And the rod which was turned into a serpent you shall take in your hand. And say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to you, saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. Um, I looked it up in some different translations and the complete Jewish Bible says, let my people go so that they may worship me in the desert. So that was the whole purpose of him bringing them out of Egypt. Right. They were freed from something to something else. Right. They were freed from slavery to worship the Lord, to serve the Lord. Right. Their whole purpose of him bringing them out of Egypt was to worship him. And, and he repeats it throughout the whole thing. Every time he says, let my people go. Let my people go. It's not just let my people go because they want to be free from slavery. He says, let my people go that they may serve me. That's right. um, so it's, and it's the same reason that the pilgrims came to America. When we look back in the history of the United States, they came to America to have the freedom to worship God as they saw fit, as they chose. Um, so we want to be free of everything that would hinder us from worshiping the Lord. So our Egypt, so to speak. We want to be free of whatever's holding us back from worshiping the Lord, from entering into worship. So to, to, to further look into the essence of Sukkot, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is holding me back from worshiping the Lord as he's called me to? What is the thing that, he, that I'm allowing to hold me back? Hebrews 12 speaks of slipping, um, of stripping off unnecessary weights and the sin which so easily entangles us and, and running our race. And our race is supposed to be bringing us closer to Abba. It's supposed to be bringing us closer to his heart and to be his representatives here on earth. Um, but sin separates us from Abba. It can't dwell in the presence of his holiness. So when we talk about Sukkot and dwelling in his presence, if we have something in us that is a part of Egypt, that is a part of our past life, that is a part of the world, we can't be dwelling in Abba's presence as we fully, as we should be. Um, the next scripture that I'm going to turn to is Isaiah chapter 33. I'm going to skip around a little bit here tonight. But they all connect together in the end. It's like a tapestry. All the, all the cords connect together. <laughs> So Isaiah chapter 33, and we're going to read a, on down through a few verses here. Um, for, starting at verse 14. Um, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling seizes the godless ones. They cry, who among us can dwell with that devouring fire? Speaking of Yahweh. Who among us can dwell with those everlasting burnings? He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who despises gain from fraud and from opposition, who shakes his hand free from the taking of bribes, 
who stops his ears from hearing the, of bloodshed and shuts his eyes to avoid looking upon evil. Such a man will dwell on the heights. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. His bread will be given him. Water for him will be sure. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. And isn't that what Sukkot is all about? About dwelling with him, about seeing him in the beauty of his holiness. And, and in, the, in this verse, it gives us the answer to how can we dwell in the presence of a holy God? How can, how, you know, he is, he is holy. And we see so many examples in the Bible where his holiness incinerated everything around it that wasn't holy. Right. But the only way that we can be holy and, and be entering into the presence of his holiness is by walking righteously, by living uprightly, by aligning our lives with him. Amen. And um, if we, it, we need to remove all the trappings of Egypt off of us. That's, that's what it all is about. When, when we enter in through this season, you know, Yom Kippur is about stripping off the weights. It's about stripping off, off the sin that we've allowed to accumulate in our lives over the year. And so that we can, but it's so that we can dwell in his presence during Sukkot. It's about preparing the way, clearing the obstacles out and preparing the way for him. Um, we need to take on the new identity of who we are as his children. There are many verses in the Bible that say, you will be my people and I will be your God. And, and we really need to take on that identity as his children. Sukkot is about developing a relationship with the one whom our soul loves. Um, the next verse is Jeremiah 2, verse 2. Next book to the right. Jeremiah 2, verse 2 says, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I earnestly remember the kindness and devotion of your youth, your love after your betrothal in Egypt and marriage at Sinai, when you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holiness, something set apart from ordinary purposes dedicated to the Lord. And again, I looked that verse up in several different translations. I like to compare them because they all say something different and hold a different meaning. And the um, common, com, common English Bible, CEB, says, The Lord proclaims, I remember your first love, your devotion as a young bride, how you followed me in the wilderness. The NLT says, I remember how eager you were to please me as a young bride, how you loved and followed me even through the barren wilderness. The voice translation, the voice is a newer translation that came out. It's more of a paraphrase, I think. But it, there's some verses that it just grasps the meaning behind it so well. I still remember the way you clung to me in your youth, in the early days of our union. Like a young bride, you loved the vows you made. As I led you from slavery in Egypt to your freedom in Canaan, you drew close to me. Even in the barren wilderness along the way, I filled your every need. So isn't that just like a picture of trust, of devotion, of, of absolute commitment? Sukkot is a time of remembering our first love. It's a time of remembering how faithful he has been to us, of remembering the picture of the trust and devotion. And, and I think so many times it's easy to, to get distracted by everything going on in life and allow the remembrance of those things to slip and to not fully consciously remember what it was like when we first knew the Lord, when we were walking the closest to him we had ever been walking. And Sukkot is a time for us to come back to that. It's to come back to the heart, to come back to our heart, really, to come back to our heart for Abba, but also to come back to his heart for us. Because you see the, you hear in, in that verse, not only just a, oh, I remember you type of thing, it's, I'm remembering your devotion to me, he's saying. I'm remembering how, how you loved me, how you followed me, how eager you were to please me, and, and how you trusted me. Even though the Israelites didn't know where they were going. The Israelites didn't know what was out in the wilderness. They had been slaves in Egypt. They had no idea what was beyond those hills that they had always known. But there was an element of trust in them, not only in God, but in Moses, that the, there was a trust in, okay, you're not leading me out into danger, you're not, there was an element of trust in that. Um, and trust is the foundation of any relationship. And trust is 
built in spending time with that person. It's built in spending time with them, getting to know them, getting to know who they are, and knowing that they're not going to fail you. They're not going to leave you. They're not going to forsake you. And Israel, the Israelites in the desert had plenty of time to learn that. I mean, after all the miracles and signs and wonders in Egypt that they had seen, they had, they had seen the splitting of the Red Sea. They saw Pharaoh's army drowned in the midst of the sea. They saw all these impossible situations turn out for their good. And if, that was, if they had any doubt in their mind that Abba loved them and was protecting them and guarding them, I don't know how they could have. But, but then you find throughout, throughout their desert wandering experience, they kept coming back to saying, you know, I want to go back to Egypt for the leeks and onions. Don't you think God could have given them leeks and onions in the promised land? I mean, it was a land flowing with milk and honey and grapes and everything that they could have desired. But it showed that there was a fundamental um, distrust inside of them, that they didn't fully and completely, they, they lost the sight of it somewhere in the desert. They, they lost the sight of their father's faithfulness. And I, I mean, I, I relate that to, I think I said this to you before, that um, if you think of a husband and wife after they get married, what if the wife came up to the husband like a year later and was constantly talking to him about how it was before she got married to him and how she wished she could go back to that and how, how, how she wishes that she could return to her former life. How would that make him feel? You know, really, I, I'm, okay, I see how much I'm worth to you, especially if her former life was in slavery, okay? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, that is worth more to you, that looks better to you than living with me, okay. But that's exactly what the Israelites were doing with, with Abba. And how do you think that made his heart feel? Because in his heart, he only wanted good for them. He wanted to protect them. He wanted to love them and bring them to the promised land, to bring them, bring them into the best that he had for them. But um, we need to not judge them, because each one of us have done the same thing in our lives. Because the ultimate, the ultimate sin is not remembering Abba's faithfulness, Amen. is not remembering how good he's been to us, is... is is counting it a light thing. And I think sometimes we can get our eyes in the wrong place sometimes. And, and when we start getting our eyes off of him, the enemy's right out there speaking. And the voice, his voice is always gonna be speaking. And the, the voices and noise around us. But we gotta focus in on that still small voice. And know in what we know, we need to go back to what we know. And in our heart, what we know is he's never left us, he's never failed us, he's never forsaken us. Um, so when, when that trust is built in a relationship, that's when we start to drop our guards and, and let, let the walls down and, and step into the place of oneness with Abba. Um, and that is the heart of, that's the heart of our worship, really. And... It, ju it just flows out of our heart, you know? Um, I got my notes mixed up here. Hold on just a minute. Okay. The heart of worship is when we completely sell out, step out of our comfort zone, and give all we are to him, to follow him completely. Just like the Israelites, they, they completely followed him even though in the later years they started struggling with it, he did say, that, I remember that your devotion at, uh, at, when you're in your days of your youth, when you first followed me. And it, doesn't that sound like Yeshua? I remember, remember your first love. You know, remember the heights from which you've fallen. So I think that that's what Abba was trying to say to when he said, go cry in the ears of Jerusalem. I remember your first love. I remember your devotion. He was awakening it in them. He was reminding them of a place that they had been, that he wanted them to recover. It shows Abba's longing to be in a relationship with his people, to, to just step into that place of oneness with us. We are called the bride of Christ. We are called the body of Christ. We are called the bride of Christ. And he always refers to us as close family members. You know, it's not, I, you know, when Yeshua talks about, you're my brothers and sisters, he doesn't say, you're my second cousins twice removed. You know, it's not it's not distant relatives. It's the close family. And every time that Abba refers to us, 
<laughs> he either uses the husband and wife example, the father with his children, brothers and sisters. It's all these close family relationships, right. which is really what, we, what, what everybody's been talking about this week, is coming to the place of family, of, of really realizing that we are a family at the deepest sense of the word. And, and learning what that means, learning what that means with us as a congregation, with, with us as the body of Christ. Um, that we're getting to the place where it's we are the body of Christ. It's not me individually. I'm not the body of Christ. I'm not the bride of Christ. That's when people start getting off into the weird things like, like Dad has talked about before, the woman who was in the insane asylum because she was the bride of Christ. And he was returning for her. But we collectively are the bride of Christ. We are his body. And when it comes to family, we affect each other. You know, just like in a body, when you, when you think of, of, of a body, each part affects each other. You know, if, if somebody, by illustration only, not in this congregation, but if somebody had a lung problem, that doesn't just affect the lungs. It's not just the lungs have a problem, the rest of the body is functioning perfectly normal and never even knows what the lungs are doing. No, the lungs affect the rest of the body. It starts affecting the brain. It starts affecting how you walk. It, it affects every part of the body. So when one of us is struggling with something, it affects the whole. And it affects the whole supply that we're giving as our offering to Abba. Um, collectively, we make up his bride. His heart yearns to be in relationship with us. Um, and, and I think that the biggest thing over the past few weeks that we've been hearing, what Dad's been saying, what Holy Spirit's been showing all of us, is that we're shifting from a place of I, me, me, into we. It's the picture, it's the very picture of the sukkah. The su picture of the sukkah is one of unity. You don't, you don't have a sukkah to yourself. It's always supposed to be the, the picture of open doors and, and, and oneness and unity. We're all gathered together under one roof, one, under the sukkah. We are Abba's family, and, we're, and Sukkot is supposed to be when we're dwelling with him, that, that we're getting closer to him, that we're, we're drawing near to him. Our individual lives do affect each other. Your sin doesn't just affect you. It affects everybody. My sin doesn't affect just me. It affects all of you. Amen. Even if nobody in particular knows what it is, the supply I'm giving is setting everything into discord, into disharmony. And Abba dealt very strongly, especially in the, with the Israelites with sin in the camp. I mean, you see how many times he dealt with it, and you can say, well, that's rather harsh. Why was he so harsh? Because he desires to walk in and with and among us. Leviticus 26, verse 12 says that. He wants to walk in and with and among us, but he can't do that if there's sin in the camp. If there's something that's setting off the harmony, he can't, he can't be walking with us in that way. Um, our horizontal relationships with each other do affect our vertical one. Right. And when there's disunity, discord, disharmony among ourselves, we can't, we can't deceive ourselves into thinking that we're one with Abba. You know, it's just, I'm one with Abba, but I have problems with these people around me. It's, you know, and, and again, back to the picture of the family. If he's the father and we're all his children, you know, if you have a problem with one of his other children, I think he's going to have a problem with that. You know, if, if I have a problem with you, I can't run to him and say, but I love you, Abba. I, you know, I just want to worship you. It's going to be like, no, you need to correct that. Amen. Which Matthew 5, 23 through 24 says, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and then you remember that your brother has any grievance against you, leave your gift at the altar and go make peace with your brother. Then come back and present your gift. So you put that in the, in the perspective of worship. We're into, we're, when we come in here on Sabbath, we're entering into worship. But if there's something inside of us that, that is, a, is holding a grudge against somebody, if there's something inside of us that's not completely right with each other, we need to make that right first, first and foremost, because we're not. Then we're not able to offer our whole hearts to Him in worship. Um, you're, it's so important because you're giving a supply to the whole. But what supply are you giving? And I think that's something that we need to all ask ourselves every day. What supply am I giving? What supply is my personal life giving today? Even when I'm by myself and nobody else can see me, what supply am I giving? Because it is real, you know, it is real that we're giving a supply. 
Um, worship on Sabbaths is not about us individually, but it is. So it's, it's not about us having our own individual encounter with Abba, but it's about giving our all, our all, into the whole to create a collective offering of true worship to him. So when we say it's, it's a, you know, where I'm coming to worship you, the I is the focus in, only in giving of ourselves, not in I'm having an encounter with Abba. I don't know what about what you all are doing, but I'm, I'm having my individual encounter with Abba. No, it's about giving our all and saying, we are coming to worship you, Abba. We are giving you an offering that you deserve. Um, now, if we, if we don't have it personally, we're not going to have it corporately. You can't, if you don't have it, you can't give it. But it seems like there's a sense that we're stepping into another level and where worship's concerned, where we're brought into the, the eyes are brought into a unified we. You know, we, we were in a place for a while where it was a level that we had stepped to where we were personalizing the songs, you know, where we were taking the we and changing it to I so that we were saying, I'm, I'm standing in awe of you, I worship you, I do this. And that was to focus on really getting it into our personal lives. And, and that's necessary. And it's time to step to the next level. And that's the biggest sense that I've been getting over the past few weeks in worship is it's, there's another level. And now it's like, now because we've been practicing it in our personal lives, we can step into saying, we worship you, Abba. We are bringing our offering. Because before, there was, there was so many, you know, that maybe not giving their, their eyes into it. And we couldn't say we. We couldn't say we are worshiping you because some may not be. But when we start getting into that place of saying, you know, I'm worshiping, worshiping you, Abba, now we can truly speak for each other. <laughs> we can truly say, we worship you. Like, this, like the song we sang on Sabbath, we, where it started out, I stand in awe of you. But then the end was, we stand in awe of you, Abba. And, and, and I think that really so captures the heart of it, where, the, like I said, the eyes are changing to we, and we are worshiping him. We're bringing him an offering. And, you know, it's like the drop of water in, in a glass. That one drop of water in and of itself can't make a big difference. But when all the drops are taken together, it can overflow the cup. So I individually might not be able to change the nation or the church, the body of Christ. But if I'm giving my all and I'm completely sold out and I'm, I'm devoted to it, then collectively, along with everyone else who's sold out, we're, we have the power to change the nation. We have the power to change the body of Christ into the glorious church without spot or wrinkle. And, and that's what he's returning for. But it's up, to, it's up to us individually, but to give our supply corporately. Um, if, if I give everything I am joined in the whole, the power is exponentially greater. Um, and that's the place when we're sold out, when we're spending ourselves on him, when we worship, when the worship is the entire reason why we exist, that's when we're going to start seeing the power of God manifest in our midst. That's when we're going to start seeing the miracles and signs and wonders that the world needs, that the world is going to be coming to see and, and partake in these times. It's going to be as when we're unified as one, when, when our hearts are completely sold out to him and we're not holding anything back, when we are so in love with him, when we're so in love with each other, that there's, there's, we're one. I don't, I don't know how else to say it. We're one. You know, it's, it's like when they say the, the one flesh covenant. We have a covenant with Abba, and we have a covenant with each other, and it's supposed to bind us together in love. But not just for ourselves. It's for the world. It's that the world might see us, that the world might see him through us, that they might see, recognize us and know us by our love. And that's really what Sukkot is about. It's about stepping into covenant with him and each other and living out of an open heart, about finding the heart of worship. And we've talked about that so many times, about the heart of worship. What is the heart of worship? It's, 
it's that place of devotion. It's that place where we're worshiping him for no other reason than how good he is, how faithful he is, for how, how he's brought us through so many, so many times. And, and Sukkot, when we're standing in here under, we can see the stars through the roof, when we have the, the, the door open wide, it bring, it, it's almost like a reconnecting. It brings you back to the heart, the, to what really matters. And what really matters isn't the physical things in our lives. You know, it's not our job. It's not, not our house, not anything that we can have. But it's, it's, the, it's the, the whole reason of our existence is to glorify him, to worship him. Like the sukkah, it's vulnerable and open, willing, easily penetrable. It's trusting Abba to protect our hearts, but being bound together in love. You know, it, it can be it can be a vulnerable thing for us to open up to each other and be in and walk in that kind of love. But that's the agape that Abba is talking about us stepping into. And it's his kind of love. And it comes out of our relationship with him. And it's like a cycle. It comes out of our relationship with him into our relationship with others, but then it circles back into our relationship with him. And it's supposed to be just going up and up and up in that ascending cycle. Of, of getting deeper into the heart, deeper, deeper into his heart, and, and becoming, becoming one with him. And then we'll find that the words of that song will become true when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come along just to bring a song, not more than a song, but bring something that will bless your heart. You know, sitting in the sukkah, worshiping from my heart because of his goodness, because, because of his faithfulness, because I love my Abba so much. And because, you know, like, like that picture, going back to your first love, going back to that picture of just following him, like it's childlike, you know, it's, it's that trust, that, that confidence that in our Abba, in our daddy, that he only has good plans for us, that he has plans to never harm us, that he has plans for our success, that he, you know, I don't, I don't even desire to go back to Egypt because he's able to give me so much more than Egypt could offer me. He is able to provide for me super abundantly, far over and above all that I could even ask, think, or imagine. And, and in that place, that has, a, that has a way of just opening your heart up even further. And, and that's when you get under the spout where the glory's flowing out. That's where you get under where his blessings are. You know, a lot of times we can get our eyes on the promises of God, but forget to look at the God of the promises. You know, and, and when it comes down to it, are we serving him because of what we can get? Or are we serving him just because he's so good? And in that place, that's when he will be able to bless us more than we can ever even imagine. And... You know, when it, again, with the, with the words, I'll bring you more than a song. When we go in there on Sabbath, it's not just lip service we're giving him. Right. It's not just songs that we're melting off and, oh, yeah, this is another song, blah, blah, blah. We're bringing him our heart, personally, but our heart. What is the heart of this congregation? We have a worshiping heart. We have a heart that just so wants to be with him. And that's the heart that we're coming back to. And we, as this family, are coming back to the heart of worship. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. The I changes to a we. We, corporately, are coming back to the heart of worship. And we're going deeper than ever. And I believe that that's, that's the step into the promised land that he has for us, is when we completely just surrender everything we are to him, and just let go, you know? Just let go and let him do his work in our midst. Sukkot is about dwelling with him in his presence together, remembering our first love and following him and returning to the heart of worship. We are set free from Egypt to worship him all for his glory. Amen? Amen. Every night, night after night after night.
Yeah, you know, the Holy Spirit's very aware of what we're doing here. Yes, he is. Uh, the devil's also very much aware of what we're doing here. Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody notice a little more noise tonight? I <coughs> sure did. <laughs> to worship God. And it's interesting that Yahweh said, is picturing that between leaving the old and entering the new, if you're going to get it right, there's got to be a development of, of proper relationship. And that's what worship is. Worship is not to come and sing songs. Singing songs is an outward manifestation of worship. Okay? Um, when, when a young man falls in love with a a young woman and writes poetry or sings songs to her. You know, that's simply an outward of ex expression of what's in the heart. And worship as we think of it, worship is the songs, worship is the notes, worship is the music, worship is the tambourine, worship is the dance, worship is all. Those are simply outward manifestations uh, of an inward reality. And if the, if the inward reality is not there, the outward manifestation loses. You're going to have an outward manifestation that's pretty poor, and so it, it doesn't take anything. But you can also have an outward manifestation because somebody has talent, somebody has gifts, somebody has a great voice, and so they can have an outward manifestation of, of worship and, and just have a tremendous voice in singing, but their heart's not there. And that'll show up ever so quickly, ever so quickly, because when Holy Spirit suddenly wants to move deeper, they can't move deeper because they're trapped into an outward performance. Worship is all about relationship. And think about what therefore Yahweh is saying. I want you to go back to Sukkot. In other words, you're, you're leaving Egypt, you're going through Sukkot, and, and you're going to arrive in a promised land, and you're going to have houses you didn't build, you're going to have fields that you didn't till, you're going to have fruit more than you could ever imagine, you're going to prosper in everything, but Yahweh builds into the yearly cycle, not one day, just one day. Let's have a birthday. Let's remember on one day. Let's take seven days and let's not just remember. Let's build a sukkah and dwell in it. And if you're in Israel, that is the requirement that you spend some time dwelling in your sukkah. So if you have a sukkah in Israel, you're going to take your meals in the sukkah. You're going to eat supper in the sukkah. You're going to, you know, some people sleep in the sukkah. Why? To, to infuse them with a sense that the reality of who we are is not the people walking in the blessings, it's the people walking in the wilderness with our God. And I submit to you that, that it is far superior to be intimate with God with nothing than to have everything without Him. Come on. There's no value in the promise. There's no value in the gold and the silver. There's no value in the multiplied houses without him. But in their, in their psyche, they understood that we could be in the wilderness and God was there performing miracles, moving our every need. It was, it was the relationship that mattered. And I believe in these last days, as, as we've been talking about over a couple weeks now, that God is trying to shift the peoples of the congregation of his churches into a place where family becomes a dimension of who they are rather than church a place they attend. In the book of Acts chapter 2 in verse 1 it says now in the day of Pentecost had come they were all together in one and, and I've always 
regret that always until just sitting there now while Jordan was preaching. The Holy Spirit said, I want you to look at that differently. I, I've always read that to mean, well, they're all together in the upper room. Which, which is true, that's what they were. But why would we say that Faith Christian Church was all together on Wednesday night in the sukkah? Well, if we're all in the sukkah, we're all together. You know, why would you say they were all together in one place because of the sukkah? Well, if we're all together, we're all together. And the Holy Spirit said, you've got to see that being in one place is not a physical dimension. It's a spiritual dimension. We can be together with our bodies in one physical location, and we're not in one place. You know, you're off shopping. Somebody else is off visiting. Somebody's planning what they're going to do tomorrow. Somebody's in the wood shop doing something. Somebody's in their car headed to the beach. In their mind, while they're physically all standing there, and we stand before Yahweh, but we're not in one place. That's why the, the Bible doesn't really talk about us as the church, but it talks about us as the assembly. The more correct word for ecclesia is assembly. And so literally, we're called the assembly of the first one. Modern translation, ever since King James, they would use the word church. But we're really an assembly, and when we change the word from assembly to church, we've got a whole different idea. Church is a building. Church is a group of people that we happen to belong to. We have a membership in the church. But when you're talking about an assembly of people, you're now open to understand that are we assembled together with one mind, one heart, and one purpose, that's an assembly. That's an assembly. And so Yahweh was trying to get them out of Egypt into the promised land through a process by which they were meant to gain an identity as the people of God. They failed at it. They picked up the outward identity. We're Jews. We're circumcised. We have the Ten Commandments. We do this. We celebrate Shabbat and everything. But when they came to the very edge of the promise of God and the spies went into the land and they came back out, they found out they were not the assembly of God. Even among their leaders. And, 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 and hear this. The leaders weren't together, so therefore the people could never be together. These were the strongest leaders, the, the 12 spies. These were the these were the leaders. These were the strong people. And they, they went in and saw the promised land, and they came back and sat down, and two of them saw the God that led them through the wilderness and made this as a piece of cake, and ten of them saw the problem. You had a divided leadership, and that resulted in a divided congregation, which led to an entire generation losing the promised land. When you read about the revival in church history, revival gathered like-minded people together. And people who were not like-minded got there and became like-minded. They changed their mind. That's God. I'm going to be, think like that. I have my opinions about this, but I'm there. I see God working. I'm going to become like that. It's like you've heard the story I told about, you know, Holy Spirit saying to me at Brother Hagin's meeting when everything's going wild. Are you in or are you out? You know, if you're out, go home and, and go pastor. It'll be, you know, go live your life. I still love you. You're born again. You're going to go to heaven when you die. But are you into what I'm doing or are you not? If you're out, go home and be religious, do whatever you want. But if you're into my game, welcome to the club. Well, well, God's always asking us, are you in or are you out? And this church is going through a season now where, where it's are you in or are you out? And, and being out doesn't mean, well, you're out, we don't like you, don't talk to you. It simply means there's suddenly going to be a shift. And there will be a movement of hunger toward God where everything else that identifies us will take second place. And that's all we want to do. And when we want to do that, 
will never be bothered if you don't want to. Because we're going to go ahead anyway. We're going to step into worship. We're going to step into in the power of God. We're going to be uh, radical in our vision of the Lord. So th- this whole idea of stepping out of we to uh, out of I into we, you know, Georgie nailed it on the head. And, and it's a deciding change. And in fact, uh, Vicki Dean and I were just talking about that at the campus. Are we supposed to sing in our songs we are I? Well, we went through a period that where we, we changed all the we's to I's because if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus as Lord of your life, if Yeshua is not your personal Savior to whom you've made a heartfelt commitment that you're my Lord and you have a right to tell me what, what I do with my life, if he's not first in your life personally, then how can we ever call it devotion? If you can't say, I love you, Lord, with all my heart, soul, and mind, if you can't say that personally, then you're an outsider in the group. You're not born again. You're not alive in Christ. And and, and we can't make that decision for you. And and so hopefully, as we were going through the past years and, and saying, I was to shift you into a place where that's a very personal worship. Some still stand outside of it. It's worship. It's a thing we do. No, worship is is my heart crying out to God. It's not the song I sing. You know, when someone says, I, you know, I've been going to church for years. I, I've never felt a tear singing a song. You know, I, I, I have great pain for you. Because that means you're living such a sterile life, you don't know the joy of a personal, intimate relationship with your Savior. I didn't say you're not saved. I didn't say you're not going to heaven. You know, there's marriages out there where, where people have very sterile relationships. Hi, how are you? Good, huh? But there's no emotion. There's no, no depth of commitment. And how sad to go through life and not experience the depth of intimacy with, with one another. But, but how sad if we don't have that with God. See, God walks in authority. You better look at Adam and Eve. God says, walk in authority. You're going to look at me. Wants you. He wants to be in relationship with you. And so we went to the eye so that would happen, but now suddenly we've come to the end. If you haven't gotten into the eye, we can't wait for you. You're still going to have to discover that. You're still going to have to be there, but we can't sit around another year waiting for you to get it. But it's about my personal relationship with God. It's been presented to you, it's been taught to you. You've had opportunity to decide that. And so we're now taking the eyes, and we're all going to stand together as I'm an I, you're an I, you're an I, and we're all together. And suddenly it's we, and I become very conscious that your commitment to the Lord is my commitment to the Lord. That's the only thing that makes a difference. That I know 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 you love Yeshua with all your heart, soul, and mind. It's the same spirit in you that's in me. We may be at different levels of different understandings. You're looking at his heart from here. I'm looking at it from here. But we're absolutely in love with the creator of the universe, and we're committed about the same thing. He absolutely loves me. He absolutely loves you. And there's no shadow of doubt about that. And you may have different skin color than me. You may have different age than I do. Uh, you, you may be of a different gender than I am. That all fades away when we understand that we're standing one together. And I don't have to question your love. I don't have to say, well, you're an outsider. I love him, but I don't know that you do. And that's going to come as we move into a week where we're all uh, moving forward as a group. And, and I believe if I look at, at revivals and how things go, that, that, that there will be a creation of an intensity of time when the people go through their own we want to be on the journey of love. The seas are rough at that time. The seas are very rough at that time. But if we bind ourselves together, we'll get to the other side. We'll get to the other side. Amen. So thank you, Georgia, for that, uh, that powerful, in the midst of all the distractions and backing up trucks and motorcycles. Mm-hmm. You didn't hear it because you were so plugged into the spirit that you were just moving ahead. That, um, you know, this is what Sukkot is for us. We're, we're, we're continuing the journey. And, uh, you know, uh, we don't count by numbers. We count by what.
put them in the store. So tomorrow night we'll be back here, and we're going to continue. Who's up tomorrow night? Andrew. Andrew is going to be speaking tomorrow night. Oh dang, you don't want to. You don't want to miss this. The Lord of God. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, he, he's discovering that when you get something from God, it just begins to multiply. And I think he he started out with one message. I think he's got about ten boiling in him right now. We might just say, okay, you can't give all 10 now, so give one and we'll give you the next 10 weeks, you know, or something <laughs> like that. And glory to God, but, uh, but come with your inspectors out tomorrow. And, and let's, let's remember, when we go down there, do we have to get this? Is, it, is the grass going to help us with this or not? I don't know. If we don't, we don't think so. Okay, fine, we'll just we go. Have we have apples. We have apples. Yeah. Apple cider. But, but, you know, let's, when we walk out of here, or if you're standing and sitting over the fire, Let's remember, this, this is who Abba has said is our family. <laughs> Amen? You didn't choose it, but he chose it for you. Amen? He placed you in the family and said, well, these are your brothers and sisters. Oh, you know, we, we might not have picked each other, but guess what he did? <laughs> and, and we're together, and whatever happened, this greater circle called Pittsburgh and then Massachusetts and then the United States. We have a little part to play in our world band, and our band has got, got a purpose and a destiny together, and, and so we're it. We're it. We're it. We're in the ship he's designed, and he put us together and said, okay, row your boat together. And we're getting our oars going in the same direction at the same time, and, 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 and learning how to strip off the things that get in the way, and uh, I'm excited about it. I trust you all that uh, this Sukkot is really a journey for us. And it's reminding us to kind of cut loose of things we, we've gotten accustomed to and to step into uh, what he's doing. Amen? Amen.